All right, salam alaikum. I'm going to start all over. Uh, and alhamdulillah ta'ala, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'furu wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyati amalina may yahdihu lahu fala mudilala wa may yutlil fala hadiyala wa ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ahtahu la sharika la wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu rasulullah. Ya ayyuhaladina amanu taqu laha ha qattu katihi walla tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun. Indeed, all the praise is due to Allah. We praise Allah. We seek Allah's assistance and forgiveness. We seek refuge in Allah from the evil within ourselves. Whoever Allah guides, no one can misguide them. Whoever is not guided by Allah, no one can guide them. I bear witness that there is no deity, there is no God worthy of worship except Allah alone. Allah alone has no partners, and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi is his slave and messenger. O you who believe, fear Allah by doing all that Allah has ordered you and by abstaining from all that Allah has prohibited. Fear Allah as Allah alone should be feared and die not except as Muslims in complete submission to Allah. Alhamdulillah. I'm about to proceed. So um, I want to just begin by reminding you that for some of you, may, this may seem really, really repetitive. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala leaves no leaves unturned. And so, for example, you might have noticed that my pattern is to cover a verse, talk about the key words in that verse, look at the general meaning of that verse, the relevance of that verse to Tawheed, and then the lessons drawn. And so um, I've been looking back, and I don't repeat surahs. I don't know if any of you have known, noticed this. And so I was actually looking at how today we'll begin to look um, at uh, seeking refuge with beings other than a lot beings. We will then see how that goes. We will move to seeking refuge with any one. And you might say, well, what's the difference? And you'll see the verses, how very clearly Allah draws a distinction between these things. And then uh, we're going to look at helpless partners ascribed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, then we're going to look at the angels, uh, their, how they fear Allah. And we will go from that um, just to sort of, and then to intercession. And I'll be looking at um, I'll be demonstrating for you um, how some people erroneously worship saints um, and or, or people on the earth in graves, some actual practical application. Um, but for each, every one of these topics I just named, there's a different, there are different ayat addressing them. So we'll begin today looking at Surah al ahqaf the sand hills or the curved sand hills, some say, verses five and six. And who is more astray than he or she who invokes besides Allah, those who will not respond to him or her until the day of resurrection? And they of their invocation are unaware. So these people, deities, things that people are praying to, they're not even aware of it. And they won't even be aware of it until the day of judgment. And when the people are gathered that day, they who are invoked will be enemies to them, and they will be deniers of their worship. So all of these deities, gods that we've talked about, stones, idols, people, angels, jinns, whatever, they will deny the people that sought them. And they will tell them, no, um, I did not tell you to worship me. So it's, it's, um, it's just really beautiful to me how I see how Allah fortifies and really warns us over and over and over again to avoid polytheism. So what are the key words in Surah 46 and verses 5 and 6? Those who will not respond to him, they are unaware and they will be enemy to them. So I just think, uh, Brandy, can I ask you to mute your mic? Thank you. Um, so who are those who will not respond to him? 
those invoked besides Allah are incompetent to fulfill invocations of their followers. They do not have any capacity. They can't even fix themselves. They are unaware. Those invoked besides Allah are unaware, even unaware of the invocation because they may be dead persons, inanimate objects, or angels preoccupied with that for which they have been created. They will be enemies to them. So those who are invoked besides Allah will disassociate themselves from anyone invoking them uh, in this life. So what is the general meaning of these two verses? According to these two verses, it is determined that the most deviate or deviated person in the sight of Allah are those who invoke false deities that are incapable of responding to people's invocations in the worldly life and are unaware of such invocations. When the day of judgment comes and people are gathered, the one besought will disassociate themselves from whoever invoked them. The polytheists are unfortunate in both this life and the hereafter. Their invocations will not be realized in this life and their worship will be rejected when they are in dire need for relief in the hereafter. The two verses state, the relevance of these two verses is that the two verses states that whoever invokes anyone other than Allah anyone or anything, is the most astray. Invocation is an act of worship, and it becomes an act of polytheism when devoted to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the lessons that are drawn from these two verses is that invocation is an act of worship that turns into an act of major polytheism in cases where it is directed to anyone or anything other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the lessons that are drawn from these two verses, whoever invokes anyone besides Allah remains miserable in both this life and the hereafter. Polytheism is the greatest manifestation of going astray in the Sarat al-Mustaqim, in the straight path. The verities of the resurrection, assembly, and reward in the hereafter are pointed out very vividly in these verses. Unlike what the polytheists perceive, idols neither hear their invocations nor respond to them. Bliss in both this life and the hereafter can be achieved only by worshiping Allah alone. So now we will look at another verse. We will look at Surah an naml the ants, and that's Surah 27, verse 62. Is Allah not best who responds to the desperate one when he or she calls upon the divine and removes evil and makes you inheritors of the earth? Is there a deity with Allah? Little do you remember. And so interestingly enough, when we see this word deity, um, I'm always searching around. There's a book called Encyclopedia of Gods. And that book has over 2,500 deities uh, of the world, and it's a hardcover book, and it's called Encyclopedia of Gods, and it has over 2,500 deities of the world. So what are the key words and phrases of um, Surah an naml verse 62? Inheritors of the earth, and that's talking about the nations or the ummahs succeeding each other. Uh, is there a deity with God? means that there is no deity who can respond to invocations or bestow the favors mentioned in the Quranic verse. Little do you remember, as a result of your little reflection, tadabr, contemplation, on all the grandeur and the favors of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you associate others with Allah. The general meaning of the Quranic verses is that Allah rebukes the polytheists who invoke others besides Allah, though they admit that Allah alone responds to their invocations and removes their afflictions at times of adversity. So Allah has also makes them the successors of their predecessors. The polytheists are condemned for worshiping false deities that cannot grant them any of the favors bestowed by Allah inasmuch as their reflection on the favors they bask 
in is too little to raise the fear of Allah inside them. They fail and they fall into the abyss of polytheism. The verse implies the invalidity of seeking refuge with anyone other than Allah. For only Allah can respond to the desperate, remove the harm, give life, and cause death. So as we've been going with the pattern, the lessons drawn from the Quranic verse is the prohibition of invoking others besides Allah for achieving that which none is capable of but Allah. No one and no thing created can make the sunrise and the sunset. No one of these deities except Allah can create an ocean, can create period. So the lessons that are drawn from this Quranic verse is that though the polytheists believe in the oneness of Allah's lordship, they are not admitted into Islam. So we have a lot of people that call themselves monotheists. And we talk about the Abrahamic faiths. They say that they're all monotheistic. But if we look into the practices, we will see that they are not truly monotheistic. The oneness of Allah's lordship is a clear-cut proof of the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's divinity, uh, i.e. Allah being the only one worthy of worship. The polytheist belief in the oneness of Allah can be taken as a counter-argument against their repudiation of the oneness of Allah's divinity. So here again, we have people that talk about and say they believe in this, but their behavior is different. Now, Ubaidah ibn Samad narrated, during the lifetime of the Prophet wasallam, there was a hypocrite who used to hurt the believers. Some of them said, let us go to the messenger of Allah and seek refuge with him from that hypocrite. Thereupon the Prophet وسلم, said, do not seek my refuge, but seek Allah's refuge. So if the Muslims had sought the refuge of Muhammad وسلم, how would that have been different to how the Christians seek the refuge with Isa alayhi salam? So the compiler of this particular hadith, At-Tabarani, uh, his full name is Suleiman ibn Ahmed At-Tabarani. He was a prolific, prolific compiler and imam who compiled three large compilations of prophetic hadith, which is, of course, plural of hadith. So what are the key words that we found in this hadith? A hypocrite. Now, in this context, that was referring to Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, uh, and he was called at that time in history the head of the hypocrites. The next phrase was, do not seek by refuge. So the Prophet وسلم, disliked to be sought for help besides Allah. And so we now look at the general meaning of this hadith. When Islam spread widely and Muslims became a strong community, a group of the unbelievers decided to embrace Islam and covertly remain unbelievers. So they were called hypocrites. Such hypocrites used to hurt the believers in word and deed. Such was the case of the man mentioned in this hadith. Some companions wanted to seek refuge with the Prophet وسلم, to dissuade the hypocrite from his abuses. The Prophet was able to fulfill the request for help, but instead he denounced the wording they used as an implied lack of respect towards Allah Azawajal, exalted be Allah. The Prophet وسلم, wanted to teach his companions to block all possible avenues leading to polytheism and keep their sound belief intact. So when we talk about sound belief, we're talking about Aqidah. 
So sometimes we'll say someone's Akita is weak. Their understanding, their belief is not intact. It's got some flaws. Some, you might say a person's Akita is flawed. So here Allah was trying to protect people, not Allah stuck for law. The Prophet ﷺ was trying to protect people from that. Now what you might remember, and this is interesting, so we talked about a masjid previously, in the previous lecture, um, that was built by hypocrites. So here you see another way that hypocrisy is being addressed. In this hadith, the Prophet ﷺ condemns the act of seeking refuge with anyone besides Allah. And the lessons drawn from this hadith, it is forbidden to seek refuge with the Prophet or anyone other than Allah. Muslims are recommended to avoid profane words so that their sound belief can be kept pure. So if you hear a teacher, when they are asked a question and they don't know the answer, they will say, a healthy teacher will say, Allahu alam, Allah knows best. They will say, I do not know. Uh, so we have to be very careful what we say. Every single word that we say, we will be held accountable for it. All possible avenues leading to polytheism must be blocked. And so if we go back and we look at the lesson that I gave about the sorcerer and the guy who, you know, cut a head off and put the head back on and all of that, we see the, the great links that the righteous predecessors, the pious predecessors, believers before us took to make sure that shirk did not enter into the ummas, the, the nations of Islam, so to speak, the groups of Muslim people. <clears throat> So we should endeavor, um, endure uh, adversities for the sake of Allah. Um, hypocrisy is an abominable sin. The interdiction, prohibition, or degree of offending the believers is an act of hypocrisy. So we also see this little pearl, this little uh, valuable piece in that hadith. So, now we will move into talking about helpless partners ascribed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we'll look for these subtle differences. In Surah Al-Araf, the heights, which is Surah 7, verse 191 and 192. Do they associate with Allah those who create nothing? and they are themselves created, and the false deities are unable to give them help, nor can they help themselves. So here we see Allah adding another dimension here, reminding us that they cannot create, and yet people worship them. So what are the keyword phrases in Surah 7, verse 191 and 192? Do they associate with law, Allah, those who create nothing and they are themselves created? The question is introduced in the form of a reprimand. Allah, Azawajal, exalted be he, rebukes those who associate partners with Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those who create nothing was the next key phrase. Any creature taken as a deity, though it never creates nor deserves to be worshipped. The next phrase, key phrase, in, was, and they are themselves created. Those deities worship besides Allah are created, and a created being can never be set up as a rival to a creator. And, and it's a very probably simple analogy, but um, one who can't draw can never be compared to an artist. Um, I can't draw a straight line. Um, my writing, once it gets cold, I can't read it. Um, and so here people are worshiping something that cannot help itself, cannot create. Um, and so here again, the final phrase, nor can they help themselves. Uh, such fault deities are powerless to guard themselves against any imminent harm. If there's any uh, gods, idols out there, if the lightning comes and strikes it, they can't protect themselves from it. 
and therefore they cannot be help to others. The general meaning of the Quranic verses, Allah rebukes the polytheists for ascribing partners that cannot create anything. Neither do these false deities have any attributes that may render them worthy of being worshiped, nor can they guard those invoking them against any destined harm. Also, they cannot guard themselves against any harm. Invoking such false deities is null and void, for a created being is by no means a rival to the creator, and a helpless being is by no means a rival to the omnipotent Allah who dominates the whole universe and is the Lord of all the worlds, the ones that are seen and the ones that are unseen. So the lessons that are drawn from this verse, the Quranic verses invalidate polytheism since they imply attachment to impotent, impotent and incapable creatures. Only the creator is worthy of worship. The oneness of Allah's lordship is a clear-cut proof of the oneness of Allah's divinity. It is permissible to argue with the polytheist in order to support truth and confute falsehood. So we see here that you can pose a question to them. And I would dare say that one of the greatest ways to teach is to ask questions and to get people to look within themselves, to ponder and reflect. So now we move to Surah Fatir, uh, Surah 35, verses 13 and 14. Allah causes the night to enter the day, and Allah causes the day to enter the night, and has subjected the sun and the moon, each running its course for a specified term. That is Allah, your Lord. To Allah belongs sovereignty, and those whom you invoke other than Allah do not possess as much as the membrane of a date seed. So here we are reminded that these deities that you're calling upon, do they have anything to do with the planetary system? Do they have anything to do with night and day making that happen? And then Allah tells us they don't have as much as the membrane of a date seed. So the key words in this particular verse, and those whom you invoke other than Allah. Angels, prophets, idols, saints, um, whatever. That's what it's referring to. They do not hear your supplication. Angels and prophets are preoccupied with the ultimate goal for which they were created. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, I created men and jinns for naught, except that they worship me. So these angels and prophets that people are praying to and asking for intercession. They aren't paying attention to those people. They are paying attention to pleasing their Lord. They would not respond to you. Key phrase, false deities are incapable of meeting the request of their worshipers. They will deny your association. On the day of resurrection, false deities will disassociate themselves from their worshipers. They're going to be disgusted when people call out and say, I worshiped you. And none can inform you like one acquainted with all matters. None other than Allah, as a wajal, exalted be he, can inform you about the consequences of any matter and its end. The general meaning of these Quranic verses is that Allah states that all false deities, angels, prophets, idols, etc., invoked are powerless to fulfill their worshippers' supplications. And the lessons that are drawn from these verses, the, inv the, inv sorry, the invalidity of polytheism is clearly established. The one who deserves to be invoked must possess what he or she is able to grant, must be able to hear the invocation, and must be able to respond to the invocation. Well, I've never seen an idol in any museum that I visit that could hear me, that could respond to me. And if it's very interesting because I, as a human being, if I don't have peace in my heart, I cannot manifest, realize, and materialize peace in my world. And these so-called deities really have nothing to offer except whatever material they're made out of. You can take that 
and then you might get killed by the other people that worship that deity. Sound beliefs should be founded on clear-cut proofs and firm certitude. Yaqeen, uh, not on speculation or blind imitation. Well, our forefathers did that as an example. These verses prove that Allah possesses a comprehensive knowledge of the consequences of all affairs. Anas ibn Malik narrated that the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, got a wound on his head and his front teeth were damaged on the day of the Battle of Uhud. So he said, how will these people, the disbelievers who have wounded their prophet, attain salvation? Therefore, Allah revealed the Quranic verse from Surah Al-Imran, Surah 3, verse 128, not for you, O Muhammad, but for Allah, is the decision. Now, this hadith is found in Bukhari and Muslim. So let's look at the key words of this hadith and uh, the meaning of this hadith. Uhud is the famous mountain north of Medina where the well-known battle took place. Uh, the prophet's trial here was not only his head wound and damaged teeth, but his despair of the disbelievers of Quraysh and whether they would ever believe. Thereupon Allah Azawajal revealed that the decision as to whether they would believe was up to Allah. Now later we'll come back to this piece and eventually inshallah, if Allah wills, and we'll have a lecture on, and this has to do with Tawheed and you'll see that Allah chooses whom he will. So even though there are authentic hadith that says that for someone to bring someone to Islam, it is worth more than the whole world and everything in it, we are instruments to guide people to Islam, but only Allah calls people to Islam. So yes, people can invite, and there's a lot of blessing in that, but they cannot call someone to Islam. Only Allah does that. I hope you can see a very slight distinction there. So the destiny of deciding um, is who becomes to Islam is Allah alone. This hadith is a proof of the invalidity of exclusively beseeching the help of those in authority or of the righteous besides the help of Allah. The Prophet Wasallam, could not guard himself against harm and he had nothing to do with the destiny of people. So if you remember in a previous lecture where a spell was cast upon the Prophet Wasallam, if you could see here, if a man, a created being, had the same power as Allah, then surely he would not have had his teeth broken um, or his head banged in. Um, so what are the lessons from this hadith? It is invalid to set the allies of Allah or the rivals as, as or the righteous as rivals to Allah. For even the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi had nothing to do with the destination and with greater reason Anyone other than the prophet has nothing to do with it. Alhamdulillah. So what are the lessons drawn from this hadith? The prophets were susceptible to illness and affliction. The obligation of dedicating one's acts of worship solely to Allah, since Allah is the all dominating. Showing forbearance and patience over afflictions for Allah's sake is highly recommended. So even though the Prophet ﷺ had been wounded, where was his heart? His heart was immediately asking Allah questions about these people. He wanted so badly for them to believe. And I'm sure that many of us can relate to how we wanted our family members to believe, or perhaps our children and the pain of that, but the Prophet remained focused on Allah, remained without any complaint to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Muslims are forbidden to express or experience despair of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's GPS, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy, no matter how many sins he or she committed. 
Uh, and of course, the final piece that we learn from this hadith is that um, the rule does not apply to polytheism. Ibn Umar narrated that he heard the message of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, after rising from the bowing posture of the last rakah of the Fajr dawn prayer, saying, O oh Allah, curse so-and-so, and so-and-so. And so. After he had said, Allah hears him who praises him, Sami Allah Huliman Hamida. All praise be to you. So Allah, exalted be Allah, revealed, not for you, O Muhammad, but Allah is the decision. So here, like any human, the messenger of Allah, he wanted to curse someone. And you'll get more clarity on this because I know this really makes stirs heads when I read this hadith. Just hang tight and you'll get the answers that are causing you disease. <laughs> He used to invoke Allah against Safwan ibn Umayyah, Suhail ibn Amr, and Al Harith ibn Hisham. So Allah revealed, not for you, O Muhammad, but for Allah is the decision. So that he hated hypocrisy. So the Muslim loves what Allah loves and hates what Allah hates. But we're not allowed to curse. Abdullah ibn Umar ibn al Khattab born in Mecca, was a venerated and pious companion and a well-known scholar. He died in 73 after the Hijra. So let's look at the key words, perhaps the tafsir of this particular hadith. Allah, curse so-and-so. This is an invocation to Allah. It's an appeal or prayer for the deprivation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy to befall someone or something. So this is where we understand that you're not allowed to do this. Now, very common among many Arab cultures is this thing, I'll curse your mother, I curse on your father's grave, I curse this and I curse that. Here we have a very clear and very precise, unquestionable hadith that Allah said, no, you cannot curse. Allah only has the power to curse. No created thing has the power to curse. And we should work hard to refine our character so that we do not curse anything because there's another hadith that says that what you curse on this earth will curse you. So it will come back to you. The three persons mentioned were the heads of the polytheist on the day of Uhud. Afterwards, these three converted to Islam and Allah accepted their repentance. So imagine that if Allah had answered that prayer, then these people would have never experienced Allah's mercy and they would have never come to Islam. So we get a lesson here that we want to adopt mercy toward the disbelievers. We should want to adopt mercy for them because we want them to become Muslim. We don't want them to go to the hellfire. Allah admonished the Prophet via the revelation of Surah 3, verse 128, not for you, O Muhammad, but for Allah is the decision. After he prayed that these three hypocrites would be cursed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we see that this hadith shows that the Prophet cannot guard either himself or his companions against the evils of polytheists. He instead sought help from his God, the omnipotent, and the all sovereign. The Prophet Sallallahu behavior attests to the falsity of the beliefs of tomb worshipers who adore Allah's friends and righteous persons. And inshallah, we're going to talk about that in more detail in future lectures. More lessons drawn from this hadith. It is invalid to invoke the allies of Allah and the righteous to bring benefit or remove harm. It is permissible to invoke Allah within prayers to let Allah's wrath befall the polytheists, but we can't curse them. We can ask for Allah's justice, and we know that justice sometimes is wrath, but we cannot curse them.
So it also teaches us that making invocations during the prayer does not invalidate the prayer. So often in sujood, there are many ahadith to this effect that we make supplications to Allah because we're in Allah's favored position in the most humble position. So this is another proof in regards to that. According to the hadith, imams of prayer are to pronounce the tasbih. And the tasbih is when we say, Sami Allah Hudiman Hamidah. Allah hears him or her who praises Allah. And the tahmid saying, Our Lord, all praises are for you, immediately after raising uh, from the bowing position called rakuh. Helpless partners ascribe to Allah. And this is a hadith that we will look at and perhaps will sort of be where we'll, write, we'll wind up talking about this hadith. Abu Huraira, may Allah be pleased with him, narrated. When the verse from Surah Ash'ara, Surah 42, verse 214, that reads, and warn O Muhammad, your closest kindred, was revealed, the messenger of Allah rose and said, O people of Quraysh, save yourselves from the hellfire, as I cannot save you from the punishment of Allah. O Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib, I cannot save you from the punishment of Allah. O Safiya, the aunt of the messenger, I cannot save you from the punishment of Allah. O Fatima bint Muhammad, ask me anything from my wealth, but I cannot save you from the punishment of Allah. And this is found in Bukhari, Muslim, and Tirmidhi. So we cannot save anyone. And imagine the pain of the Messenger of Allah, that helplessness that we experience when we pray for someone for years and they have yet to come to Islam. Abu Huraira was the nickname of Abdurrahman ibn Sakhir ad Dalsi. He was one of the great scholars and prolific narrators among the venerable companions of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He narrated more than 5,000 hadiths and died somewhere between 57 and 59 after the Hijra. And you know, when we talk about, and I often try to remind my students, I'm just a primary teacher. I'm not a scholar. The scholars of Islam, and as you'll see here, narrated 5,000 hadiths. I have met a few humans that have memorized three or 4,000 hadiths and have memorized the Quran. The Messenger of Allah rose. Let's look at the key words and phrases of this hadith and break it down one by one. So what does it mean he rose? He climbed up to the hills of Asafa. And whenever you go to Hajj, inshallah, all of you will go. You will stand by Asafa and you will make dua. By yourselves. What does it mean, by yourselves? Buying a soul means saving it from the hellfire by believing in Allah and obeying Allah. Nobility of ancestry will not save anyone from the fire. So I warn you, many of you who are new converts, you are going to meet people and they're going to brag to you about being from the lineage of the Prophet And they're going to present it as a very superior thing. This hadith reminds you that that lineage will not do anything for you. It's not going to be an intercessor for you. I cannot save you from the punishment of Allah, is in this hadith. Since his kindred may have conceived that he would intercede on their behalf if they should be doomed to the hellfire, the Prophet intended to remove that thought from their minds. And how reasonable would it be for them to believe that when there were 360 idols around the Kaaba at that time? Abu Huraira narrated that Allah commanded the Prophet وسلم, in the Quran to warn his closest kindred. Who is most worthy of our witness, of our da'wah, 
of our invitation that our family in submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's command the Prophet وسلم, climbed up the hill of Asafa and called out the people of Quraysh including his uncle his aunt and daughter and gave them all an exclusive warning against the punishment of Allah and I know that one of the things dearest to my heart is the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his mercy and kindness allowed me to be instrumental in inviting my father who received the invitation and my stepmother received the invitation. The Prophet instructed his family to seek their salvation through believing in the oneness of Allah and obeying Allah by word and deed. He informed them of his incapability to save them and warned them that bad his close kinship would avail them nothing unless they believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The relevance of this hadith is that it is impermissible to ask the Prophet وسلم, or anyone else except for what he or she is capable of in this life. It is prohibited to ask someone to do something exclusively confined to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's power. This hadith confutes the fallacies of the tomb worshippers who invoke the dead pious people to remove their afflictions and fulfill their needs. The, this hadith provides an argument against those who worship the prophets or the righteous and believe that such pious people can respond to requests exclusively fulfilled by Allah as a wajah. <clears throat> It is impermissible to ask someone to do something not within his or her capabilities. The Prophet ﷺ was keen to submit to the commands of Allah and convey Allah's message. The people most worthy of the Prophet ﷺ's intercession are those who obey Allah and adhere to the Sunnah, be they among his kindred or not. And some of you may think that that is a contradiction, but in the future lessons, you'll understand what I mean by that. It will be made clear. Being one of the Prophet Sallallahu relatives will be of no avail in the hereafter unless accompanied by sound faith and good deeds based on the monotheistic creed. So alhamdulillah, um, I think we have enough time. I'll go into angels. We'll talk about the angels a little bit today. Um, angels duly fear and obey Allah. Just like we fear and obey Allah, the angels fear and obey Allah. Now you might ask a question, they only please Allah. They only obey Allah. They don't have free will. Why on earth would they fear and obey Allah? A great lesson for those who will contemplate on this. In Surah Saba'a uh, Sheba, Surah 34, verse 23, and before Allah, intercession can be of no avail to any, save one in whose case Allah may have granted leave therefore. So what Allah is telling us here is that on the day of judgment, there are going to be some prophets perhaps and some righteous people. There are going to be some beings that will be able to make intercession, but we don't know who they are. And they will only be able to do it with Allah's permission. So we can't count on it. We don't know who or where. So let me start the verse again. So before Allah intercession can be of no avail to any, save one in whose case Allah may have granted leave thereof. So much so that when the terror of the last hour is lifted from their hearts, they who have been resurrected will ask one another, what has your sustainer decreed for you? To which the others will answer, whatever is true and deserved, for Allah alone is exalted, the most high, the grand. So the relevance of this verse uh, these verses demonstrate how much the angels who never disobey Allah fear Allah. 
they are the strongest and greatest creatures worshiped besides Allah. Obedient angels are in such a state of terror and fear of Allah. How is it that creatures with greater reason and freedom of will invoke others along with Allah Azawajal, exalted be Allah? If people were going to invoke any other than Allah, surely it would be creatures, it would not be creatures inferior to the angels. And to me, that seems to be just common sense. If we're learning that these perfect angels who never ever picket or disobey or boycott Allah cannot be asked for something, then why would we ask something that isn't good, that's not produced any good deeds? So the key words and phrases in this is when Terah is removed from their heart. When the angels hear Allah's words revealed to Jabril, they tremble and get terrified until they become in a state similar to a fainting human. And Allah is the most high. Allah is of the highest dignity, superior domination, and is the most exalted. It says the grand. Allah is the exalted most great. And so the general meaning here is Allah the exalted states that whenever the angels hear words revealed to Jibril, they tremble. They get terrified until they become in a state similar to a fainting human being. As soon as Terah is released from their hearts, the angels ask each other, what has your Lord said? Thereupon they reply saying the truth and the law is the most high, the grand. So we continue to look at the lessons here, the Quranic verse. Provides an argument against all polytheists who associate false deities with the law. Deities neither equal to the angels nor comparable to them. The Quranic verse proves that speech is one of the attributes of Allah. As a wajel, it's not a created thing. Only a speech is appropriate for Allah's majesty. So any of us, and when we speak, we make mistakes. I've made numerous mistakes today. But Allah's speech, the kalam of Allah, is perfect. And it is Allah's speech. It's not something created. So that's why it's perfect. The words of Allah are not created because the angels, according to the verse, said, What has your Lord said? They did not say, What has your Lord created? Allah is the most high above all creatures that Allah created. Allah is the most great. The Prophet said, When Allah is ordained some affair in the heaven, the angels beat with their wings in obedience to Allah's statement, which sounds like a chain dragged over a smooth stone, and this causes them to be scared. This comes in the Quranic verse, Surah Saba'a, Sheba, Surah 34, verse 23, and those wait until when terror is removed from their hearts, they will say no, say to one another, what has your Lord said? They will say the truth, and the law is the most high, the grand. Then those who gain a hearing by eavesdropping, that is the devils, will hear the statement of Allah. Now this is really amazing because this is a narration from Abu Huraira, and I feel like it's important for me to cover this before we go into our discussion. Uh, then those who gain a hearing by eavesdropping, that is the devils, will hear the statement of Allah. Sufyan, a sub-narrator said, those who gain a hearing by standing one over the other like this, and then he illustrated, he spread the fingers of his right hand and placed them one over the other horizontally. So when one of them, the devils, hears the statement of Allah, 
he throws it to the one below him and so on and so on, sort of like a chain operation um, until it reaches the sorcerer or the soothsayer. So these devils, these jinns, these beings were in the sky at one time. They would listen, they would catch a piece, and then they would bring it down to the earth and the soothsayers would use that. The burning flame may overtake and burn the eavesdropper before conveying the news to the soothsayer or the sorcerer, and he or she might convey it before being overtaken by the burning flame. Now, there's some scholars that say that this could be meteors, um, you know, falling stars, uh, Allahu Allah, Allah knows best, but there are some people that speculate this, that actually will kill some of these beings, these devils, before they get to the soothsayers, but some of them would make it. The soothsayer or sorcerer would thus add a hundred lies to whatever information that this devil gave them. His prophecy will prove true as far as the heavenly news is concerned. People will say, did he not tell us that on such and such a day and such and such a thing will happen? Therefore, people believed him or her because of the true news heard from heaven. And this is found in Al-Bukhari. So Sufyan ibn uh, Uyayna ibn Maynun al-Hilali was a trustworthy hafiz and an authoritative scholar from among the grand imams, and he died in 198 after the hijra. So what are the key phrases in this hadith? Those who gained hearing by stealing were the devils who used to eavesdrop on the angels' talks in the heavens. Now think about it. The angels see us down here worshiping, and they are talking to Allah. They're telling Allah, Oh, Allah, your servant is forsaking their bed. Oh, your servant is worshiping you. And then Allah mentions us in higher places. MashaAllah. So what is the general meaning of this hadith? The Prophet Sallam expounds on the angel's glorification of the words of Allah and the state of fear hearing Allah's decrees inflicts what the state of hearing uh, Allah's decrees inflicts upon them. The angels discuss with each other what Allah has said and they receive answers from each other. The devils eavesdrop on angelic conversations and convey them to sorcerers and soothsayers. When the devils hear these talks, they are pursued by shooting stars. Despite this, they manage to convey these talks to sorcerers and soothsayers for the reason only Allah knows. Nothing falls outside the boundaries of Allah's omnipotence, omniscience. The devils, sorcerers, and soothsayers blend the heavenly words with the myriad of lies which are accepted by people due to the few true words included. So the relevance of this hadith, this hadith refutes the fallacies of polytheists about worshiping angels, prophets, or righteous people. When angels hear the words of Allah, they are frightened in spite of the great strength they possess. This hadith invalidates dedicating any acts of worship to angels. Uh, other false deities are inferior to the angels and are thus worthless of any worship. Now, I actually met some people here in Orlando that actually pay a so-called Muslim who tells them that they talk to the angels. This is why this class is so important. It is so sad because there is so much shek. You will be shocked if you open your eyes and ears, the spiritual eyes and ears of your heart and your physical eyes and ears, how much shek exists among ignorant Muslims. So the lessons drawn from this hadith, 
The hadith exalts the glory of Allah as a wajal exalted be Allah and attests that Allah is the only one worthy of worship. Proves that Allah is the most high, that speech is one of Allah's attributes and that Allah's speech is appropriate for Allah's majesty and grandeur. It proves the falsity of sorcerers and soothsayers, even if they may occasionally speak truth. The majority of sorcerers' divinations are false, and therefore they are regarded as liars. So alhamdulillah, uh, we will close there. Um, I want to remind you, please, that you can make donations to the organization. We are still doing da'wah. Um, yesterday um, was probably my last public appearance for a long time, but I had been asked several months ago to do the two khutbas at AMCC, and also a couple had asked me to officiate their marriage. So alhamdulillah, I want you all to stay safe. I want you to know that I love you for the sake of Allah and that I miss you. And I'm so thankful to have this time to be with you on Sunday morning and on Thursday night. I would remind all of you, we still are having the Thursday night class at 9.15. I love you for the sake of Allah. I'm going to turn the recording off now and open up for um, discussions.